In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. <coughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now at the hour of our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and it shall be created. Let's pray. God, to instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise and ever joyous in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Fatima, Pray for us. Saint Joseph, Pray for us. <coughs> Father Bruno Terry, Pray for us. Saint Paquita, Pray for us. Saint Jerome Meliani, all God's angels and saints. Pray for us. The Lord be with you. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever receives a righteous man, because he is righteous, will receive righteous man's reward. Whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple, amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> very consoling gospel which our Lord says that our Lord pays attention to not only big things but he pays attention also to what we might consider minor details minor details uh, in the eyes of God are monumental accomplishments giving a glass of cold water one of these little ones, Jesus says, that person is going to res receive his reward. So um, uh, be aware of that. And um, I think that this Bible passage is a, is a really good springboard into the, um, the reading we have for the Divine Mercy, which I meditated upon this morning. I was really touched with it. So where we've arrived at is number 148 147 was somewhat long 148 is um, just a kind of a medium sized paragraph with probably about a hundred words but I think this um, relatively short paragraph is just <coughs> dense in, um, in content so um, read it and then glean a lot of spiritual fruit from this. That's where we arrive at number 148. It's after 147. <laughs> Before 149. <laughs> you know, what an excellent math major I am. A noble and delicate soul, even the most simple, but one of delicate sensibilities, sees God in everything, finds him everywhere and knows how to find him in even the most hidden things. Finds all things important. It highly appreciates all things. Thanks God for all things. 
it draws profit for the soul from all things. It gives all glory to God. Places its trust in God and is not confused when the time of ordeals comes. It knows that God is always the best of fathers and makes little of human opinion. (coughs) It follows (coughs) faithfully the fairness, the faintest breath of the Holy Spirit. Rejoices in the spiritual guest and holds onto him like a child to its mother. Where other souls come to a standstill and fear, this soul passes on without fear or difficulty. What a beautiful number. Almost without, without, com- uh, without comment, you got your holy hour there, right? I just encourage you, you know, when you're kind of struggling in your prayer life, don't forget about uh, these gems that we're going through. But we're here to try to give you a little bit more light on these uh, wonderful spiritual gems that were given to us through the mediation of St. Faustino. So, Seeing God in all things. Let's talk about that. Seeing God in all things. In my meditation this morning, (coughs) the thought that occurred to me is uh, being aware of God, this is very nation, in the beauty of nature. Uh, Now, God does speak through nature. God does speak through nature. I think all of us have to be attentive to the way that he speaks to us through nature. (coughs) Just just one element in nature seemed to uh, trigger within me uh, a lot of spiritual insights. And it was the sun. Uh, I, I love the sun. You just mentioned the sun uh, right away. There's so many different mystical, spiritual, somewhat poetic images that come to my mind. And with your permission, I'd like to share a few of those. Okay, the the sunrise. Sun rising in the morning. Makes me think about Easter. Because uh, that's the principal liturgical feast every year is Easter. Every Sunday should be a mini Easter. The darkness was dissipated as Christ rose from the sun, rose from the dead. So every time you're aware of a sunrise, you can think about Jesus being raised from the dead, giving us life and life in abundance. Then <coughs> the sun, sun which is elevating. It's rising. It's rising higher and higher and higher. The sun rising at midday makes me think about the um, the holy sacrifice of the mass. The sun is being raised. It's elevated. 
what happens is the priest raises up the host. There's an elevation there. <coughs> Even look at the um, configuration of the sun. The sun is circular. What about the host that we lift up? Circular also. So a sun at midday can make you think about priests celebrating the holy sacrifice of the Mass. You look up at the sun, you can make a spiritual communion. If you're not in Mass, you invite our Lord to come into your heart, at least spiritually. How about the sun rays that are emanating from the sun? That calls to mind in um, St. Peter Chanel when we expose the Blessed Sacrament. You ever notice the, the monstrance? Not all monstrances, but our monstrances, you've got, uh, you've got the Luna where the host is present. You've got the window outside the Blessed Sacrament. Then you have those golden rays. And it really, it really looks like a sun. It's supposed to be reflecting or imitating the sun. <coughs> so when you're, when you're meditating upon, when you're looking at the sun, that should make you think about the Blessed Sacrament exposed and your desire to be present in front of the Blessed Sacrament, to make your holy hour. Then, two different titles for Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is also the Son of God. Literary license, S-U-N, of God. He's the son of God. Son also makes me think about not only Jesus, but it makes me think about the Holy Spirit. Catechism of the Catholic Church <coughs> offers us many, many symbols for the Holy Spirit. The most obvious would be the dove. Another one would be that of wind. Another one would be that of the cloud. Other one would be that of fire. The ascent of the Holy Spirit was done in fire. If you look at the sun, you think about fire, and that makes you think about the Holy Spirit. Okay, basic physics now. What are the two basic properties of fire? It's the fire gives us both light and heat. <coughs> what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit gives us light. Light in our intellect. What about heat? The fire of God's love within our hearts. And I was thinking about the whole idea of an eclipse. <coughs> when you're not able to see <coughs> the sun. So that's an image of mortal sin. Right? But in mortal sin, do it, it blocks us from, from God. So even something like an eclipse can call to mind the blockage of the light of God in our lives which is because of our own choice, and that's called mortal sin. So the whole purpose of this explanation is to help us to become more cognizant, more aware, more sensitive to how God speaks to us, as St. Faustina says, God speaks to us, the delicate soul, God speaks to us, in all occasions.
So I hope and I pray that um, as a result of this reflection that starting now or starting tomorrow, tomorrow that you, you're, you're really aware of God's presence as the poet says, in him we live and move and have our being. <coughs> okay, I'd like to take another image. Let's take rain. I've had a lot of rain over the past couple of weeks, huh? I've been here in California for quite a few years. This is about the most rain I've remembered in the past few years anyway, no? Usually you get a day or two, but we've had it almost on and off for the past 15 days, right? Can rain make you think about God? Probably see the prospect of rain, you get angry, huh? Well, maybe you shouldn't get angry. Maybe, maybe you can thank God for the rain. Okay, these were the reflections that came to me. Rain makes me think about the water that was poured on my head um, more than 62 years ago in Michigan when the priest said, and I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so the rain coming down can be a way in which you can renew your baptismal commitment. Amen? You know, if you have the eyes of a mystic, this, is, this will start to happen. Now you're always going to rain again. No, 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 no. <laughs> As the baptismal waters washed you, wash your soul from the stain of original sin, okay, well, it's raining down. I will renew my commitment to renounce Satan, all of his pomps. I will renew my commitment to follow God fully and totally in my life. Amen? Then how about this? As the rain is coming down, think about the Blessed Mother. The rain is coming down. Every time you pray the rosary, you have a torrential downpour of grace. So hopefully the raindrops that are descending upon you you can be invoking Mary the full of grace to allow Mary to permeate and penetrate and imbue your total presence. Because if you have this mystical, somewhat poetic perspective of life, that's why I'm trying, uh, I'm relating this to what St. Faustina says. She says, wherever you go, if you have that delicate soul, God speaks to you through everything. Through everything. How about this? Maintaining the connection between the rain descending from heaven and the Blessed Mother. Our Lady of Siracusa in Italy, uh, Our Lady of La Salette in France, Our Lady of Akita <coughs> in Japan, <clears throat> you know what they all had in common? A lady of Siracusa was an approved apparition in Italy. She wept blood. A lady of Akita. She wept blood. I, I think very few of you, have, you've probably heard of La Salette, right? No? My mom sent this, uh, this, was, this was from the La Salette Fathers in New Hampshire, which is a really, it's a really beautiful tabernacle. And if you, if you, if you look at it, you, you close the tabernacle, door. there's a lot of symbolism in it. But it's kind of like a summary of the message of Our Lady of La Salette. Have any of you heard of La, La Salette? 
and most of you know. Um, she appeared in uh, about 1840, 1850, in the time when the Curie of Ars was, uh, was hearing confessions. No? And she appeared to two, Melanie and Maximum, in the, the highlands of I think it was southern France. But you know, it's one of the most, most striking images of Mary because Our Lady of Guadalupe was standing, Our Lady of Fatima was standing, Our Lady of um, Lourdes was standing. <coughs> I'll show you Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of La Salette. See me? Very striking. She was sitting down and she had her head in her hands and she was weeping. Can I tell you why? She was weeping because of the sins. <coughs> Our Lady is suffering, weeping because of the sins of the many people. Can I tell you the three different sins that they were committing back then? Would you like to know? One was that they were blaspheming. Second is that uh, they were eating meat on Friday, and that was the liturgical um, norm back then. And they, they, they just disregarded that totally, so they were breaking church rule. And third, didn't go to Mass on Sunday. So for those three reasons, Our Lady was weeping. Yeah. Think Our Lady might weep over the United States? So in a certain sense, I'm giving you a different interpretation of the, of the raindrops. Two or three seem to be very encouraging. This one might be more difficult for you to listen to, but face it, I mean, Mary, she's the mother of the mystical body of Christ. She's the mo uh, mother of the members. <coughs> and Mary suffers in the mystical body of Christ because of the sins of her members. So there's another interpretation of the, of the rain falling. <coughs> the tears of Mary. The rain gives way to the sun, and the sun gives way to the beauty of a rainbow. <clears throat> and that's symbolic of after the, after the trial and the cross, consolation will come. As a nation rule. When you're in desolation, be patient. Be patient. Make sure you pray, you meditate, you know you're faithful to the rules. But once the rain has disappeared, the sun will come out as well as the rainbow. I'd like to give you one more image and I'll move on to another section of this paragraph. One more image in nature. Do you like the seashore? I like the seashore. If you look at the waves, does that say anything to you? Not really, huh? For me, I, I, I've always, um, I've been on, and I've been at the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, being a man from the East Coast, no? But what, what, what struck me most, it makes me think about one of God's attributes. Two of God's attributes. Which would be God's omnipotence. Those waves 
can be very powerful, a tidal wave, no? I think Eric has a lot of experience in that area, right? Isn't that true, Eric? Waves can be very powerful. It wasn't that tsunami there in Indonesia. It was basically a huge <coughs> wave that just engulfed three different countries, killed like a third of a million, last I heard. That's huge, right? So you see the power of those waves manifesting that God is much more... That's just a, a mere inkling of the power of God. But also, if you were to go to... Uh, Joe, uh, Seal Beach, ever been there? You only live there, right? If you go to Seal Beach, I've been to Joe's house, he's not far from the shore. If you go there and you're walking along the shore, you're going to see those waves coming in, but if you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, the wave's still going to be there? How about tomorrow? How about next week? How about in 15 days? That makes me think about God's eternity. You know? God has no beginning and has no end. I haven't heard anyone write on this. this is, these are my own reflections, but wow. God is all-powerful. God is eternal. Has no beginning and has no end. We had, <coughs> we had a, a beginning, right? But we have no end. Because once God gave us a soul, we are, our soul is immortal. The purpose of our soul is to be united with God forever in heaven. Amen? Principle and foundation. Huh? Okay. Uh, now, uh, going back to our text, she says, sees God in everything, in everywhere, and knows how to find him in even the most hidden things, <coughs> finds all things important, highly preaches all, appreciates all things, thanks God for all things, draws profit for the soul from all things, and he gives all glory to God. Okay. Up to this point, we've been talking about <coughs> discovering God in uh, the beauty of nature. One of my sermons about six months ago, I said that we have to, have to be able to read three books. God speaks to us through nature. God speaks to us through the Word of God spiritual exercises, the Word of God that all of you have meditated upon with profound depth, I'm sure, right? Hello? At least you tried, right? But also that God, <coughs> God speaks to us, God speaks to us through circumstances. Right, Doctor? He really does. He speaks to us through circumstances. Speaks us through events. Okay, let me give you two opposing concepts. Do you know the difference between good luck and divine providence? Are they the same? They're polar opposites. Really, they're polar opposites, if you think about it. If you want to get me angry, say, good luck, Father. <coughs> People say that at times. In, in, I mean, I don't, I don't yell at them. But inside, I'm disturbed. Because I don't believe in luck. Well, none of you have a rabbit's foot in the back of your pants pocket, No. Or good luck charm, or or four leaf cleave, uh, clover. Uh, <coughs> the theologically, really believing in luck is really against the first commandment. Did you know that? It really is. 
We don't believe in luck. We believe in divine providence. Divine providence. Everything that happens, God is aware of it happening. He's watching it. He, he's, he's aware, he allows it to happen. He allows people to abuse their free will. He allows people to commit sins. He's not going to hold us back. So when people get angry at God, they do. They <coughs> say, if God is so good, why did God allow that man to kill that innocent child there? And they're blaming God for that. Really, that's common. Really, think that's terrible. You probably know people that are angry at God because of someone did some evil to another person. God's not responsible. God did not create us as puppets. When he created us, he didn't, this is called the, the human puppet factory. No. Oh. Marionettes, they say. No, we're not puppets. We have free will. We can either use it or abuse it. Now, this is a motivation for all of us. If we don't do it well, start tonight. What is the most difficult prayer for most of us in the spiritual exercises? It is? Uh, Alma? What? Yeah, everyone, everyone seems to agree. The examined prayer is very difficult. Maybe you don't even do it. Hmm? Maybe it's my fault that I don't give enough time to it because our program is so packed. Maybe we'll work upon that next session. Eric and Mary, want to work on that? I mean, we do go through it. We give a really nice card that's, that the Carmelite nuns have given to us. And there's Father Tim has a book on it. Hopefully you've read it. I've read it. <clears throat> but um, the point that I'm trying to make now, connect it with Ignatius and Faustina, is if you rewind, you rewind the film of your life, and you do it every day, and if you really do your daily examine, well, you're going to see how God has intervened during the course of that day. Now, why is it that we do it so poorly? I, well, I'll throw out, I think, three or four um, reasons, I think. And all of you talk to your spiritual director about this. Years ago, I was uh, having a meal with Father Tim Gallagher. And um, we were talking about this. And I told him, I think I was in Boston, I said, no, Father... Father Tim used to be my spiritual director when I was a seminary. I said, you know, I, I struggle with the daily exam. He said, well, you're not the only one, no? And um, I said, um, doing it at, at night, and he said, you know, Ignatius never says it has to be done at, at 11.45 p.m. He never says that. I, th I think most of us think, and maybe it's my fault, it has to be done right before you go to bed. Have you, any of you ever done it before you go to bed? And you know, yeah. <laughs> you're agreeing with everything you hear, huh? <coughs> so maybe it's such that we should be doing it some earlier time. What I've been doing over the past year is um, uh, doing mine at about 9.45, walking in the parking lot because there's no one there at 9.45. And I can't fall asleep if I'm walking in the parking lot. <laughs> I don't know how Tobias was able to be there at the fence and fall asleep with his eyes open. I've never really understood how he could do that. The birds took advantage of that, right? Mm -hmm. And the droppings, no? But you're not going to fall asleep when you're walking, probably, no? Um, I think maybe um, we're afraid to look deep into our hearts. 
We're afraid to see some, something there that we don't want to see. And that means uh, maybe we're lacking in fortitude and humility. <coughs> so those two things. Humility to recognize what's there. But the fortitude to be willing to maybe change certain attitudes or um, things that are really not what God wants. But also, um, I, th I think we're, we're shirking a lot of choice graces that God wants to give to us because a good part of it should be in thanking God. Okay, so, I mean, most of your day, you, you people are, are doing pretty good things. And maybe not, not maybe not 100 percent. Probably a good part of the day, you're working hard, you're thinking about God, you're praying, you're serving, you're making your holy hour, or some, most of you going to mass, you're saying your rosary. All those are very good things. But if that daily examine is done well, then you're going to be more and more attentive to what we're talking about today. More and more aware of God's uh, his, uh, his presence. He, he permeates, he, he imbues our whole, our, whole, our whole milieu. Okay, uh, I was able to uh, write down um, some examples from a couple of saints trying to put this into practice. The first is... Um, and even though, according to Ignatius, who was the greatest expert in giving this spiritual exercise after Ignatius himself, I'll give you a hint, the Pope canonized him only two years ago. He was one of the companions with Ignatius. It was not Francis Xavier. Saint Pierre Favre. Okay. That was my French. Hmm? Did he aspirate that well? Okay, Saint, so Saint Peter Favre, he, according to Ignatius, he was the greatest expert in giving the exercises. He was a roommate with Francis Xavier in the University of Paris. He's going to die in his 40s, a relatively young man when he dies. But he was giving the exercises all over Europe to the kings and the queens and the dukes and the, <coughs> the most um, influential people in Europe, you know, in, in the world, so to speak. They all wanted him to, to direct them. Now, Father Tim told this in one of, his, um, one of his conferences. I'll probably get some of the details off the mark, but I think I'll, 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 I'll give you the essence. He was called to give uh, the exercises to someone uh, like, like a king or a prince in... Um, who was in a palace. Okay, this is the 16th century. So, um, the, the, you know, the first Jesuits, they dressed in a very simple garb. I mean, they didn't dre they dressed like, like princes or kings. Or So, he goes and he knocks at the door uh, to um, be able to meet with the, this high royal official, call him the king or the queen. The porter sees him at the door and says, who the heck are you? I'm Pierre Favre. No? Well, he didn't do that, no? <laughs> and uh, the porter says, uh, Saint, uh, uh, Father Peter Favre, I know who the dickens this guy is, so you're not going to get in. So he wouldn't let him in. Now eventually he's going to get in. But what, what happened in that moment? What would you do? Oh, I've done this spiritual exercise with Father Broom. Father Broom also often spoke about the third degree of humility. Now is my golden opportunity. <laughs> Fat chance. I doubt it. 
I think most of us would be infuriated. We'd be very angry. <coughs> We'd probably try to knock the door down. <coughs> push the porter aside, no? You know what he did? It, well, first of all, how many times is how many times has God knocked at the door of my heart? And I have decided not to open up when God is knocking at my heart. How many times have people in general been exposed to Jesus knocking at their heart? And they close the door to Jesus knocking. Then he goes on to say, well, given that I have been rejected, I have the opportunity to practice mercy and forgiveness. I will forgive him and I will be merciful. And listen to this. And he prayed that, Lord, I pray that when he dies, and when I die, Jesus will open up the door to heaven for both of us. Wow. Man. For me, that's a saint. How, what a high level of holiness that is. No? You almost don't believe it when you think about that. Because the natural reaction is to, is to seek some type of revenge, right? So be keenly aware of the, the events in your life. How God, God allows certain things to happen in your life to bring greater good out of it. Think even about your sufferings. How God has allowed your sufferings to bring greater good out of it. I invite all of you to maybe sometime within today or tomorrow, on the weekend, maybe call to mind some really acute suffering you had to go through. And now you look back in retrospect, you see how God used that to bring incredible good out of it. You hear me? This has only came to come to me the past two years. And I'll tell you. And I see, I see God's divine providence, but through so much suffering. <clears throat> when I was 14 and 15, uh, my, my passion was for sports. I, I love sports. I hated school. I, I mean, I, I did. <laughs> I did pretty well, but I did. me and my older brother called it going to jail, no? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we didn't like to go to school. Uh, we, tried, we did the best we could, but we, we didn't like going to school. I, for me, it was just sports, no? So when I was uh, I, I 14, I don't think you have any in California. Maybe you did when you were younger. The uh, President's Award of Physical Fitness. Did you have it here in California? Yes. Okay. At least back in the 60s and 70s, usually only one or two kids in the whole school made it because they would. And um, I, I went, I went with just like that. It was a piece of cake for me. So we had to run. Um, I remember I was like 13 or 14. And I ran the 600 and 141, which was a. I was a seventh grader. I had, it was faster than the eighth graders too. And uh, the gym teacher had my older brother in it, and he's saying, "You know, your younger brother's got the best record." And I ran it like twenty seconds faster than my older brother. No, so he was kind of going like this. No. Then I threw the softball two hundred forty feet. I was uh, 
4'11", about 89 pounds. So. I ran the 56.5, uh, 10 pull-ups. Uh, and we also had to do the um, climbing the rope. I was like, I was like in Chango. I was like a monkey. When <laughs> and my best was uh, the shuttle run. California don't have that. The shuttle run is uh, you'd be in the gym and you had these lines on the um, on the gym floor and you'd run and touch one and go back, back and forth, back and forth. We call it the shuttle run. No? <coughs> So anyway, anyway, I got uh, I got that award, and that that same I think with the same summer I pitched my first no hitter. Okay, in Pony League, uh, the thing is I I, per, I I perfected the curve. They said don't throw don't throw the curve until you're already in high school, and I said I don't care about that. No. <laughs> so I practiced it with my older brother about a thousand times, and the first the first game of the season, if you know how how you throw a curve is you've got to break your wrist, okay? It's a violent action. And they're afraid you're going you're to really hurt your arm. So I threw it in. So that, uh, I pitched my first no-hitter. So, but what happened was, uh, <coughs> moving from, m moving from j junior high school into, into, into high school, I ended up by damaging my knee cartilage underneath my knee became loosened and I did this the dumbest thing in the world I was throwing snowballs in the middle of the winter without warming my arm up and I and I ruined my arm so I ruined my arm I ruined my leg there I was going into high school the first two years of high school I couldn't play any sports it was the most painful thing in the world I made so many Naveenas to St. Jude. I mean, I did. I think I, I, I just almost made them tired of me. I mean, Naveena after Naveena to St. Jude. Then um, my dad took me to the best doctor in New York. Remember, in Greenwich Village. Ever been there? Greenwich Village would be the, the top height of Beverly Hills. All these limousines driving away. I'm going to the doctor to see if he might be able to give me some remedy. Nothing. So as a result, I couldn't play sports for two years. So painful. You know what I think would have happened? I tell you, I probably would have made it to, to the professionals, maybe a triple A. I would. I, I was thinking replacing Mick, Mickey Mantle. That was just you know, <laughs> pie in the sky, you no. Know? No, but, but, but if, if I kept advancing in my sports prowess, probably would have made it. But I never made it. And as a result of that, gave, God gave me, gave me the grace to be a priest. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and I say that because uh, that, that just occurred to me about, about two years ago. I was, I was heading in the way toward, you know, a, a profession of sports, no? Uh, but God didn't want that. When I was a kid, I was crestfallen. I, I, I was angry. Why is this happening to me? So God, God allows, God allowed, and I look back in retrospect, how good God is. How good God is. Now, if I'm playing professional baseball, they won't know when they retire? 39. I'm almost in my mid-60s. <laughs> I've been retired close to 25 years. Old hat, no? I feel almost as if I'm in my prime as a priest now. How good God is. When I was 13 or 14, I, where's God? Where is God now? I have to replace Mickey Mantle. No? Okay, let him retire number seven. I'll take number ten. Okay. <coughs> now all of you are called, I think, to do the same. 
rewind the film of your life and see how God has been walking with you. What do we say in the Psalm 23? Even though I walk in the dark valley. Remember that, that Psalm? I walk in the dark valley. You are with me with your rod and your staff. So that's a reflection. And that's what, 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 what Faustine is saying is this. If <coughs> we are open to God and his grace, we see God in everything. We see God in the sun. We see him in the stars. We see him in the sun. We see him in the moon. We see him in those in the ocean. We see him in those tidal waves. We see him in the raindrops. <coughs> we see him in people we meet. We see him in moments of success. But also we see him in the moments of the cross. So it's incumbent upon us to pray that we would have the eyes of the mystic. No matter where we are, no matter what we do, God is present to us. As the, as the Greek, po the Greek po poet says, in him we live and move and have our being. So there's no one in the world that, aside from Jesus himself, was more keenly aware of the presence of God than the Blessed Virgin Mary. Let's ask Mary to pray for us. Let's ask Mary to walk with us. Let's ask Mary to accompany us. Let's ask Mary to pick us up when we fall. Let's ask Mary, who was present in the sanctification of, sanctification of John the Baptist. Ask Mary for the grace to focus our eyes and attention on Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins. <coughs> Glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I'm anticipating uh, Eric's announcement, but I don't know that we're, we're going to have a holy hour, right? Um, we're going to have it tomorrow at 11 o'clock, is it? Okay, so good. God bless you, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. And I will have a couple more announcements, and God bless you, and may the Lord bless you always. Thank you.